Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session, The Elementary Years, a session for parents of children with PI in grades K through 6. My name is Alyssa Creamer, and I will be your moderator for this session. The goal of this session is for parents to have the opportunity to hear about the special considerations they need to take while their children with PI are in elementary school or grades K through 6. Joining me today is Valerie Riley. Valerie is a teacher within the Lancaster School District in California, where she provides instruction to students with medical needs. Valerie has long, been a longtime member of our community, and it is my great pleasure to welcome her today as she shares her expertise in navigating your child's education. Welcome, Valerie. Hi, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I have been a teacher for 29 years of special education in all grades. And so I've worked with 504 plans, even though they're not special ed, as well as um, as well as the IEP process. Um, the basics of what we're going to do today is to determine the difference between an IEP and a 504 plan um, and to go over what do parents of elementary students need to know about school and PI at uh, the different kinds of accommodations, how, I'm, how we might be able to deal with your child's emotional needs considering their PI, and um, a few resources that are available. I myself have um, common variable immunodeficiency as well as my son has it. So he was actually diagnosed first. So we went through this process with him and then they found out I had it. The big thing is communication. Communication is the key. And the reason we say that is because it, it helps you to avoid the frustration, misunderstandings. And communication is in lots of different forms, especially since we've moved to on in a lot of areas because of COVID to um, online instruction where the kids may not be in school. Um, but there are different ways in person. Again, if you go and you talk to them in person, it's really important, you know, that you have paper with you that you take it because you're going to want to put down who you just talked to, what was discussed, the dates just so that you're able to go, okay, wait, on so-and-so date, you said that my child could do this, and now you're saying this, you know? But if you're able to go back and to actually use those dates, it significantly helps because it, you know, it's like, okay, this was what we decided here. Because a lot of times things do, it will turn around and you'll wanna have that information. Again, on the phone, you will want to put the date, the time, who, who you talk to, what, what you were calling about, and then what was determined. What is the by when date? Um, and that also is part of the IEP process. There's a section on IEPs that says who will, if something still needs to be done, when will it be done by? Um, in writing, just take notes of all that you communicate. Um, some of you might use Dojo. Um, if your school's, your child's school uses it. Um, a lot of people don't realize that you can actually print the dojo messages and emails. Emails, obviously you can, it has that information that you need on there. Um, a big thing is people want to know, okay, what is the difference? You know, what is the difference between the 504 plan and the IEP? Um, so I'm going to go and I'm going to go through and I'm going to go kind of across the board so that you'll be able to see how they differ. Um, 504 plans are for general education program. They are not special ed. And an IEP is special ed. So those are the difference in the beginning. The 504 plans are not federally funded. So they don't receive extra money. Whereas an, if your child has an IEP, they're federally funded. So they, the district receives money for, to implement. Um, the 504 plan, it requires FAPE, free and, a public, free and appropriate public education to individuals with a disability. So what that would be is that could be OHI, which is a big one that we'll be talking about more. So other health impairment. And that might be they have ADHD or an immune deficiency. My son had a 504 plan. And an IEP has individualized educational benefits. 
So, and IEP will be, it has to, you ha your child has to have a deficit that affects them, their educational, you know, and how they are able to proceed. If they're, like my son was a straight A student, so he did not qualify for the IEP. He needed a 504 plan so that we could implement the accommodations. Um, the 504 plan, they asked for reasonable accommodations, which is also in the IEP too. We've had parents come in and want us to provide equestrian training for their child. General ed students would not have access to that, so it wouldn't be considered reasonable. The 504 plans also, it levels the play in field. So it doesn't mean that it's gonna give our kids this extra, but it's gonna make it so that our kids are able to participate with their immune issues. Um, and they're not gonna be, you know, have difficulties as a result of it and be punished. Um, the procedural safeguards are in both of them. Um, the one though is the Office of Civil Rights, which would be the 504. And the procedural safeguards for an IEP are the Office of Special Education Programs. The 504 protects the rights of individuals and programs that receive federal funding. So that's a big thing that you're going to find if your child is in public school, these will, a 504 will apply. In a private school, things are a little different. They don't have to if they don't receive money. But the one thing that's really important is they're both fully enforceable because some people say, well, I need both of them. You don't really need both of them because if your child has an IEP, they have everything that would be in a 504 because you're going to put those accommodations directly in to the IEP. So a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major activities, life activities of an individual. So that is what a disability is. It has to affect your learning, you know? So they could include, but this isn't only limited to it. Seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, um, walking, standing, lifting, bending, breathing, and learning. Um, so a big thing to consider is that you're going to go in and um, go, what does this mean? Why do I have to? And as it's highlighted on the screen, it's major functions include the immune system. So whereas before that years ago, immune system wasn't added to the categories. So children that had some of these medical things, sometimes they would let, you know, would accept it and sometimes they wouldn't. But now that it is public law and the American Disabilities Act, Amendment Act of 2008 said, no, immune system is also one that functions. Um, a record of such an impairment. So what that means is that your doctor will need to write what, how it limits them. So that they, they don't have to write, you know, I did. I had my doctor write exactly what his condition was, everything. But it also is, okay, so what, how does it limit them? So you're going to want that doctor to write in the things that they need, like they may need frequent breaks. Um, so we'll be talking about that. Um, the Individuals with Disability Act has four parts. We are only going to go over part B, which is the education of children ages three to 22. So this actually, with students in IEPs, they can start school at age three. So um, that's how come it goes into effect and that's why even though it wasn't on their preschool children that are in special education programs also will be protected under this act. Um, IDEA is the nation's special education law. So it's like they can't say, no, we're not going to do it. Um, the disability, though, must adversely affect their educational performance, meaning that if your child is not, a, you know, like I mentioned with my son, if their educational performance isn't, you know, isn't affected, then they don't qualify for an IEP. Um, 
federal funding um, to states and local communities. Free and appropriate public education, which is referred to as FAPE, is the least in the least restrictive environment. The least restrictive environment, sometimes people don't understand that. It doesn't mean that means a more intense special education program. Sometimes that can mean that they're in, we put them in general ed, but they may need an assistant for part of the day. And so it's just sort of making sure that, because we can over identify or under identify, you know, the needs of a student. So it's important that you as a parent really advocate for your child in this manner, um, just because you're the one that you're the experts on these and your own child. Um, the Office of Special Education Programs is where is and the Office of the Rehabilitative Services are different ones that you're going to see referred to in your parent right books. Um, procedural safeguards. This is a biggie. This is what they're going to offer you at every one of the, if you have an IEP, this is for IEPs. So if you are in an IEP and they don't offer you, ask, can I have a copy of my parents, you know, my rights? So they may call them safeguards. They may call them the parent right booklet, um, but it has the information in there. So for the first time when you get one for your child, I would suggest you look over it because it'll just guide you. And if you do have difficulties, it'll tell you what is the process. Other health impairment is something I mentioned earlier. Um, it means that you have limited vitality, strength, alertness. Um, so you're going to be looking because what they have to do is that it is in respect to the educational environment. A, is it due to a chronic or acute health problem, such as asthma, attention deficit, um, it lists them, you can see them there. And obviously the immune deficiency would go under there. I, again, a lot of, a lot of students and that um, have other ones of those combined with their immune system. So it's not like if you do a 504, um, because it's not affecting their education, then you would look at this and you would go, but it does affect them. My child goes to the hospital. Okay, accommodations is another thing that we come into. And in the accommodations, you have to, these are, these both, let me preface it. You will use this both for IEPs and also for 504 plans. So that's why you don't need both because in both of those two things, you're going to be um, looking at what does the child need? What does your child need? And there's, they're not generic, they're very specific to each child. And you need to make sure that they don't try to say, okay, well, um, this is all we offer. You know, if it's a reasonable accommodation, then you shouldn't have to, it should be considered. For these accommodations, again, this is, these would be things you would want your doctor to write to, because how are they going to argue with a doctor? Because unfortunately, you are going to go into situations at times, and you're going they're going to not go, oh, okay, let's do it. They're going to try to fight providing some of these. Um, the first one is outbreaks reported to parents. They can't tell you a specific child. Like we would get calls, you know, oh, there's this in the school, you know, there's a case of chicken pox, you know, in the school. And so that they would report to us because at first, sometimes people come into the thing where the school says, no, it's a violation of HIPAA. It's only a violation of HIPAA if they said Johnny has, you know, chicken pox. They can say that there's an outbreak in the school. And that's something that I would recommend you have just because otherwise if your child starts coming down with things and you're like, well, wait, what's going on? Um, you'll be able to call the doctor instead and say, hey, the school said that Johnny has chicken pox, you know, and so that you're not having to wait and go through, ex you know, all these extra tests. If they know there's a case of it, they're going to check for that first. Special restroom privileges. This is something that my son never used it. He never had to. 
but it's something you want because a lot of times um, teachers will penalize students if they use the restroom more than you know at recess or lunch. So this is what we had was called the hot pass. So the hot pass is just was just there so that um, he had it. The teacher knew he had it, and all he had to do was show it. You know, he carried it with him, and he would all he would have had to do is show it. You also may want a special one for the nurse so that they can go if they're not feeling good you know your kids as soon as they've had it for a while they're going to know their bodies they're going to learn when something just doesn't feel right and so they'll be able to do that instead of going and having to go up to the teacher and you know explain because sometimes it may be stomach issues you know and so you, you really want that in there Two sets of textbooks. Um, if it's not available online, I know nowadays that a lot of our books are available online to parents, but um, sometimes it's not. In my son's school, they didn't have lockers. So they were having to carry books when they transitioned to different classes. And also if your child's sick, you don't really wanna have to go into the school to pick up his textbook in his math textbook in that, you know, if your child's in the hospital or just coming out and gonna be home for a while, you have enough that you're worried about without having to worry about, oh, I gotta go get that textbook. So he would have in the room, the teacher would have his, a set of, a book for him in each class. So he didn't have to carry it between classes and he didn't have to bring it home. Um, extended deadlines or postpone a test date due to absence. And this could be because your child had, his, had their infusion and had to go into the hospital to have their infusion and they come back and there's a test the next day. Well, a lot of times our kids aren't really, you know, they go back to school because they're fighters, but they're not really ready. They're not in the same state of mind. They may be tired, they may be having effects. And so that they will have that and ability to do the test the next day. Um, another one is a lot of times in classes, they'll say no water or Gatorade is allowed to be drank during that time. You're supposed to do it during breaks. But you know, as well as I do that, you know, before our infusions, it's really important that we hydrate and we hydrate the day after also. So um, we literally had just put water bottle and they actually said, we're gonna put Gatorade too in case your child needs it. Class notes are a big, big thing. If your child is absent, they need to be provided those class notes, um, especially if when you get into the second, third and above, they're gonna have to have those notes because a lot of times that's, you know, you need those notes too, but they shouldn't have to go trying to find it on their own. The teacher should provide them to them, whether they copy another child's notes or whether the teacher gives them a copy of their lecture notes. They shouldn't have to go and fight it because when they have to go and fight it, it just sort of really brings more stress that is undue. Um, Procedures, find out, have it written in there. What are the procedures for missed assignments? Okay, so like you may have, okay, for every absence, day they're absent, they get two days to make up without a penalize, without being penalized grades. Um, because unfortunately there are teachers that will penalize the grades. So, but if it's in there, it's just really important because then you won't be jeopardized. The accommodations is something that you don't, you wanna be able to go, okay, this is what my child needs. You may have other ones. I didn't put one on here because it's gonna be gone over in the older kid class, but because this one went to sixth grade, I know that a lot of schools, including here where I teach in California, our sixth graders go to middle school. So one of the big things that you'll wanna keep in your mind, or if your child is in a district that sixth grade is middle school, is to make sure that they have, that they have the option for classes. So like early registration, because a lot of times maybe your child does better in the morning. 
maybe your child does better in the afternoon. It takes them a while to get going. So that's a really, really important one that I didn't put on here because it isn't in all areas, but if your child switches classrooms, it's important. Another thing is how do we deal with those emotional needs? And so there's a few things that we can go over. I mean, obviously there are so many more things than is right here, but the big one is give them ownership of their own care. Teach them to advocate for themselves. The younger you start teaching them and allowing them to be in um, a part of the team when you're talking to the doctors, have them be there. Ask them, you know, what do you think? You know, how does this affect you? And the, the more you do that, when they get older, it's just going to be so beneficial. My son started at nine doing his own sub Q um, infusion. So it's just, and every kid is different. Everyone is different. Um, open communication between the schools, between all of the outside, if you have, your child needs another type of therapy and with the doctor is huge. Um, allow your child to see a counselor or a school psychologist. Some people, they get the stigmatism, oh no, I don't want my child going there, but it's really important that they have someone, you know, even at school to talk to because you're not going to be there during the day if they need to. Also, just realize that those counselors and school psychologists, if you have questions, you can talk to them also. Get them involved in support groups. If they can't go in person, do them online. There's a lot, you know, I know IDF, um, they have so many like programs that they're trying to roll out and opportunities for kids to do different things. Um, obviously when now because of COVID, we're online, we're virtual, um, but there are so many things that you can get them involved with. And for parents too, definitely get involved in support groups. I, I do ask you to stay very cautious and do not take medical advice from anyone on a Facebook page. You know, go to your doctor, always check with your doctor. Um, attend conferences. In, in person when they come back will be amazing. You meet people so you realize you're not alone. And then it's just giving them some freedom. Again, you have to go with what your child's needs are and your doctor. People used to criticize because I let my child play sports. My child played travel ice hockey and he wrestled and on varsity wrestling. And so he did these different sports. Again, I had about a heart attack when he came home to tell me he wanted to wrestle, but then we found there's this special stuff you put on them and the special lotion and they had, you know, so we were able to make some accommodations. And another thing to really remember is don't forget those non-PI kids. If you have more than one child and one is non-PI, you really wanna set special dates with them because it does affect them. A lot of times they feel guilty. Again, these are different, um, things that are available. They have, you know, the zebra tail was written by Kathy Antella, who's with the IDF. It's an amazing book. They have the school guide. They have the ID advocate. If you go, um, I know that through this conference, you can go to the virtual sites online and they'll be able to tell you what they have in that. So I really suggest that you look into those um, because it gives you resources. If there's things for your kids, and it just sort of brings you together to realize you're not alone. And that is my contact information. If you have any questions, don't just give me a call. Um, please leave your name and what it's in relation to and leave a message because a lot of times when I'm in class with my own kiddos, I can't take calls, but I will get back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie, for sharing your wealth of information for supporting children with PI through their elementary school years. Um, we now have some time for questions. So if you have a question for Valerie, you can input that into the chat box and I will read that aloud. Please do not provide any specific health related information or names of yourself or your child. Everything will be remain will remain anonymous, um, but we do have some time. So if you would like to pick Valerie's brain about supporting your kindergarten through sixth grader um, throughout their school years, um, please let us know. I'll give everyone a moment to maybe 
gather their thoughts, think of what they'd like to ask. Um, Valerie did mention that IDF has a wealth of resources mm -hmm. that are available on our website at primaryimmune.org. You can also find a lot of that information um, throughout this conference platform. There are many exhibit booths um, via IDF where you can find the resources you're looking for and download them directly. And if you can, if you contact the IDF, they also can set you up with um, someone who's gone through similar things. So they kind of match what your needs are with them, because I also do that with them. So there's a lot of different ones in different areas. Thank you, Valerie. All right, we do have some questions rolling in. So I will start with the first one I see. Someone is asking, is it better to have an IEP versus a 504? Do they have more resources with an IEP? Um, no, you have districts that will try to tell you that if it is affecting them, the big difference is the 504 is fully enforceable. They have to give those accommodations if they're needed. They just don't get funding for them. A lot of times they will refuse. They'll say they either want IEPs and we've had districts that want 504s, but you don't need both of them. And there is no real difference because the accommodations and modifications are the same. If your child is struggling and it's because of other things like they, you know, they have a learning disability on top of it, then you would want the 504, not mean the IEP. Oh my. <laughs> Thanks, Valerie. Someone else is asking if IDF offers any support virtually right now for kids with PI in this age group. So IDF does offer virtual forums, uh, virtual youth forums, and we are always trying to add to our arsenal of um, ages and activities that we provide. So my best advice to you is uh, to sign up to receive emails from IDF so you will always know when new programming is launched. Um, we always are trying to add more for different age ranges. So make sure you have an IDF My account and you are uh, subscribing to our emails and our blog posts or following us on social media and you will know all the latest about what's being offered. Uh, the next question I'm seeing is, if a principal or school administrator is reluctant to set up a 504 for a child with PI, what is the next step in the process? Um, first, uh, go in with your doctor's note that's a big thing. And they can't not meet with you on that. If they, the principal, because a lot of times vice principals actually deal with the 504s. So if you go to the vice principal and they are reluctant, go to the principal. And then if they're reluctant, you send or co contact. Um, actually, if you send an email, it really, in this instance, it has a really big impact. You send it to the vent to whoever you spoke to, the vice principal, the principal, and then you send it to the special education department at your district. And usually it'll stop there um, and you won't have to go any further. Thanks, Valerie. Someone is mentioning it that mentioning that they found it helpful to include unlimited absences in their child's 504 plan. So that way they didn't get um, notes home saying that their child uh, about tyrancy. Absolutely. Um, that is something that we had placed in there after my son was, um, he was the top student in his whole grade in the school, but he got a letter sent to our house addressed to him, not the parents of. So he thought it was because he'd been out really, really sick in the hospital. So he thought it was just about the award that he'd gotten for top student. They had actually sent us a note addressed to him saying that being absent, I mean, so my kid's crying, going, mom, look at what it says. And so at that point, we had that placed in our sons too. So it is a very good idea. In your experience, do most schools have nurses? Um, they don't have a designated nurse, most of them they will have a nurse that robes. Usually um, here in California and in Washington too, they had health clerks at the school, but they're not a nurse. So other ones have where they'll share the nurse. So the nurse will go between two or three different schools. Again, it depends. Like at mine, I work with at a school that we deal with a lot of medical. So we do have an RN and some LVNs, but that is not the norm. 
Would you say that most kids with PI homeschool or are in a regular public school? I couldn't say, um, but there are, my son went to public school. Um, we actually had him, the doctors pulled him out and we put him in a smaller program and he got H1M1 and he was only in there a few hours. So it doesn't really make any difference if you get things put into place. My son's high school was very large, like 3000 kids. And he was, you know, remained fairly healthy um, throughout it. It's just if you get these precautions in place and just make sure that all the teachers know if your child has more than one teacher request that information from the IDF. They'll send the information books and I would just take them in with me. And when I go in for my meeting, I'm like, here you go. These are for you. Uh, someone is saying that her two children need to carry a syringe and emergency medication with them. Have you seen a plan that allows the kids to carry that with them instead of relying on the school nurse? Our son was allowed to carry his EpiPen. I don't know about other syringe type meds. I'm not sure what they're talking about. So if it's an EpiPen, you can get them um, so that they can, again, they're going, that is going to be one that they fight you on. You will definitely have to have a doctor's note. Um, but I have, I know from my personal that we did get that for my son. Thank you. My child has done better with virtual learning that was implemented as a result of COVID-19. Can I request to have the same accommodations kept throughout their schooling? Again, that's going to vary um, what's offered from district to district, state to state, country to country. Um, you're going to have to, you can always request it. They just may not honor it. Um, but it is something that you might be able to. A lot of schools also have programs that are only online schools. I know that all the districts around us have one that they can continue, um, not through their regular school, but through that program, that which is virtual if they choose to, um, but it, sometimes the schools, like I know this year, our district and several of them surrounding us will give those parents that option. What is the best way to talk to my child's teacher about their PI and their needs as a student with PI? Um, just be honest. I, I mean, seriously, if you go in and try to hide it, it's, you're going to end up with just craziness. Like they actually forgot to share my son's plan with them. So after that, we gave the p teachers the plans, you know, and they forgot to. And she's like, I think your son's on drugs. And, you know, she called us and his, it actually, his oxygen level was at 78. And, and when, uh, when he got home, he went to the hospital and was in for two weeks, um, you know, and then that teacher felt horrible. So we found directly directly contacting them. And if you have problems with a specific teacher when you're emailing, CC the principal or whoever is the case provider from admin because your child shouldn't have to. At this age, your your kid shouldn't have to be the one going and telling this teacher da 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 if the, if the teacher's arguing with them. You will just be able to be there and you'll be able to go, okay, this is, here's the books. And again, I gave, I actually had ordered them and gave every teacher that he had a set of those few important ones. So they knew what it was and they didn't have to, they got to see it in a book rather than just see a doctor's letter. They got to see that, oh, okay, it's in a formal document. And a lot of times they take that even over doctor's notes, but just being honest with them, telling them you know, what's going on um, and teaching your child how to do the same, because that is going to be something when they go off to college. Um, we don't get to help them then because we went through that, too. And they're like, nope, you, we can't talk to you about your child. Thanks, Valerie. Is it okay to request that my child not be allowed to participate in certain activities such as sports, field trips, or PE? Um, well, sports is usually optional anyways. But the others, yes, you can always request. Um, 
for them to not participate in PE and at recess than that, you will have to have a doctor's note, but they should, that would be in a, something that could be put in your, if you have a 504, that could, or IEP, either one, that could be placed in there and that they would find an alternative placement, like maybe they go to the library, maybe they, there's another class they can go in during those times. So it is definitely something you can request and it's not an unreasonable request because sometimes it's their asthma may interfere with them being outside or the weather itself. Is it okay to request that my child be in a class with all vaccinated kiddos? That's that goes with HIPAA. We won't Parents don't even necessarily have to, you can ask, but there's no way because we can't, as teachers, we won't know who's all vaccinated unless they make it one of the required things like, you know, like we have for um, diphtheria and that until that time comes, they, the school won't even know, unfortunately. And I do see another question coming in, Um, homebound. How does it work and is it recommended until a COVID vaccine is approved for those in elementary school, Valerie? Um, yeah, and this is even, if, even if you weren't in a state of COVID, um, this is something that you could request. It may be called homebound, ours is home hospital. And again, your doctor will be one, the one that helps get this because the doctor has to sign that you need it um, in California. They receive one hour a day um, and it would be probably if they weren't medically able to come to school, they would probably determine that they're not going to come in person to the house either. Um, So it would be done probably virtually, but some states, they are a lot more freer right now. California, we're kind of really still on pretty stringent mask requirements and lockdowns. But in some states, I know that it could be in person. So it's usually an hour a day and the instructor would, an, an instructor, it may not be your, the child, like if your child was in class, it may not be that teacher, but it would be a, a home hospital teacher. But it definitely is something that I'm sure will be, if they, they may just give you that option to do the regular virtual this year, but if not, home hospital homebound instruction is an alternative. Again, if you think of anything, you'll be able to go back because they will put this up and you'll be able to go back with my email and phone number because sometimes it may be you think is something or something comes up once school starts and you can always just keep it and if six months from now something arises and you have a question, feel free to contact. Thank you, Valerie. And thank you everyone again for joining us this afternoon. I hope you found this presentation helpful and enlightening. And I would like to remind you that IDF offers teen forums monthly in addition to many other activities and programming. IDF also offers monthly Get Connected groups for parents of children with all types of PI, and we encourage everyone to attend. These groups are virtual and open to all parents across the country. For more information, you can visit www.primaryimmune.org slash events. And I'll also put that in the chat box. I see one more question coming in, Valerie, that I'll try to sneak in with just two minutes left. Can you register in another state for virtual school? Texas has suspended their program. Um, That again is question. It depends on if it's for a public school. No, but there are some private schools that do go in through different states. You'll just want to check accreditation and that. So again, it's something you'll just have to check into. They would be able to tell you if you have an online school, but a lot of online programs do go for different states. Thanks, Valerie. That was a great question. All right, this concludes our session on the elementary years. We encourage you to please continue to join sessions throughout the 2021 PI conference. Education programming will continue tomorrow, Thursday, June 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your evening and take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Valerie.